Welcome everyone to Notable's Driving the Data-Driven Enterprise series. For this episode, we have three talented guests joining us to share their experience, insights, and tips on creating data-driven work cultures. I'm very excited to hear the insights that they have uncovered in their work. So let's move right into introductions. Again, hello, my name is Carol Willing. I'm the VP of Engineering at Notable and a longtime developer and leader in the Jupyter and Python communities. And today I'm joined by Michelle, my wonderful co-host. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Michelle Bornesian. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Notable and I am a data enthusiast. It's one of the things I've tried to bring to every role that I've had. I'm a pivot table um, a lover and um, I love to talk about how we can um, how we can use data to help empower our teams and, and bring it to more folks. Now let's maybe get started introducing our wonderful guests. Eddie, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do when you're not in webinars like this? Hi, 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 Carol, and hi, Michelle. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Etik Wirtz, I'm currently the VP product of a company called Gigaspaces. Uh, I am out of Israel, and um, in my career, I started as an engineer many years ago. I evolved into product management and has been a product manager for the majority of my career. I worked in big companies such as Variant and eBay, and I worked also with uh, small companies and startups. Uh, regardless of company, all the products that I've been working on are all uh, about uh, data and analytics, and uh, this is my speciality and this is my passion. Awesome. Welcome, Eddie. Um, Pavel, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, my name is Pavel. I'm joining from uh, the Czech Republic, and I work as the head of data at Navis. Uh, where we are building a technology platform for executive uh, leadership hiring. And uh, I guess my passion is about bringing, uh, empowering uh, people with the power of data and especially bringing data to maybe non-technical people, which uh, you'll find plenty of in uh, the recruitment space. That sounds really fascinating. I'm listening, looking forward to hearing more. And um, let's introduce our Final panelist, Art, would you like to say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself? First, hi, Carol, and hi, Michelle, and thank you for having us. And, and, and hello to the panel, Etienne Powell. I'm Art Sheikh, founder and CEO of Circulit. Circulit is a generational platform so that we are building a technology that is built to preserve your family history and share it with your future generation. So that's what my current job is. Uh, and, and passion. And before this, I have worked, has an opportunity to work with companies like salesforce.com and Dun & Bradstreet. So a lot of my experience is around data, data gathering and data visualization and making decisions out of those data. So happy to be here. Welcome Art and welcome all of our panelists. And Michelle, you wanna get us kicked off today? Sure, yes, thank you all for that intro. Um, so to start, let's think about how we actually define being data-driven, right? That can mean a bunch of different things to different companies and different levels. So let's start with that definition of how you each define being data-driven. Art, let's start with you. See, uh, for me, uh, data-driven, uh, if you talk about data-driven culture, right, that, that that culture has to come from the top. The needs arise from the ground up, but decisions are around adopting and turning a company into a very effective engine it has to come from the top, from the leadership. And then that continues to flow down downstream and then creates that ultimate culture. That's really interesting. And I think there's, I like the way you framed it in terms of top down leadership, but also that the needs are coming from bottom up. And um, Pavel, how would you define uh, data-driven culture? So for me, I kind of distinguish two levels of data-drivenness where uh, the first one, I guess easier one is being a data informed company. So data informed is when you know you need to make a decision and then you just find, uh, do some analysis or get some data to help you make that decision versus a truly data driven company has a system in place which helps it identify insights and uh, decisions to make that uh, otherwise the people in the company wouldn't be aware of that they need to uh, make. Interesting. I like that different framing um, and want to hear more about data informed as we go forward. Eddie, what's your um, take on data driven? 
Right, so definitely agree with um, both my friends here, and I want to uh, add to that that in order to enable that, you really need to have your data structured. Uh, a lot of the data that we have that we make decision by as actually comes to us unstructured. It could be call recordings, it could be documents, um, it could be so many other things. It could be, you know, meeting notes. Um, and the problem is that once you want to go and do analysis, uh, having all this data without the ability to actually run analysis over it is the most frustrating thing ever, right? So um, you really need to have, as part of your data-driven culture, you need to have the notion of structuring the data from the get-go. Uh, if you do that, then you have your data ready when you need to use it. If you don't do that, you end up um, trying to cipher through a lot of data once really, uh, you know, things are so urgent for you. You don't want to get into that. It's exactly right. And structuring data is super important. I think one of the really interesting things that I see with the three panelists is there's sort of a cycle of things that you're thinking about when you're talking about data-driven from leadership to needs, to structured data, to you know, are we data driven or, or are we informed from our data? So, um, Michelle, maybe you want to take us to the next question. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And at, at the, I really um, I think you you brought up a good point. I think you mentioned like meeting minutes and meeting notes yep. that there's like data is everywhere. Right. It's not necessarily ne just just like the numbers and the financers or the, the click rates and all of that. There's actually data everywhere, even into in something like meeting notes. Um, and so. Data is everywhere. There's so much of it. How do we actually become data driven? And what are those? And I think that a lot of us here, a lot of us on the call, we're hitting a lot of challenges, right? It's easy to say, let's be data driven. Let's put the stake in the ground. Let's be data driven. But how do we actually do that? And so let's start with like talking about a little bit about some of the challenges that you all have experienced in your in your careers and how maybe we could overcome them. Um, Art, let's let's start with you. It's uh data driven work cultures biggest inhibitors are this is the c level which uh, w it depends on how committed they are to that to that cause right so in this mm -hmm. whole equation of data driven yeah we have all this data you can you can create all the tables but in the end the data needs to get into the right hands in your organization to be able to either service your customer service your vendors or or even with employee communication and interaction so just saying data driven culture is not enough you have to build the entire funnel all the way down to your user experience level okay and that is something a lot of the leadership I've seen in my life is uh, they are learning and uh, they are still adapting to what the efficiencies that they can drive in the speed through cloud. So those are the inhibitors. I think it is on the human level. It is our knowledge and understanding and, and willingness to take on big risk, right? Or, or big changes uh, across organization. So those are early on inhibitors. Uh, downstream, we see continuously from people looking for tools and and they are going in and buying, purchasing things on their own credit card to be able to softwares to be able to do all that. But ultimately, once you make decision from the top, the whole organization can benefit versus small uh, capsules. And then it ends up creating a whole technology stack issue with so many different solutions. You got to integrate high cost and everything. So that's that's what I've seen. Yeah, um, this is not an easy question. And um, there's lots of challenges. Eddie, what? Uh, challenges or inhibitors do you see on a day-to-day -day basis? So as before, I totally agree with Art and I just want to, uh, to add uh, to what he said. Um, the inhibitor really is the human factor. Uh, the human factor because people are afraid of change. Um, and also, they're not always so keen on seeing the data if they're afraid of what it has to tell them. So uh, yes, having the sea levels uh, actually championing this, uh, that's essential. Um, however, they're also human and they also could be afraid of change. And sometimes they could be um, hoping that the problem is not there. And many times the problem is being masked by the appearance of having the data. Uh, and that sometimes happens because there are certain vocal people that, um, share their opinions as if they were facts. And this could actually mask reality. And what we really need to make sure is that we find a way to differentiate between the opinions and the facts. 
I like that. That's a really interesting um, insight. And one I think we'll explore more when we talk about how do we get past all these inhibitors. But Pavel, what do you see as the um, inhibitors and challenges? So, so I'll follow up actually on, on what uh, Etty was saying is that it's all about the change. And even if you get people motivated for the change, if you get them excited about it, it still might not be enough. And that is because building the culture is essentially a habit building exercise. So if you just give them reports or analysis, even if they are willing to use them, they might not remember at the time when it's useful for them to go back to that report. So I think it requires quite lots of patience and like working closely with the people that are supposed to be the end users to help them build these habits of making decisions based on data, ideally embedding uh, some analytics into meeting agenda so that you start the meeting with looking through the data or really help embed it as a habit rather than an ad hoc uh, action. It, absolutely. And, and people just in general, people are hard. And um, I think one of the things that I run across on a day-to-day -day basis is jargon of you know, if I have a C-level person, the way they look at data and speak about data is very different than a data scientist that I'm working with. And, you know, almost having those data translators who can, you know, help each side understand each other and reduce that fear, uncertainty, and doubt of, you know, should we even be doing this? How should we be doing it? So, Michelle, let's see what um, things our guests have found helpful to get over these challenges. Yes, our, yeah, follow up. Please go. There is huge benefits ultimately, right? For organization leaders actually can make good decisions if they don't have good data, right? So everything right. that teams across are working towards it ends up creating those important key dashboards and metrics that leaders are looking at. And that is what Eddie was talking about, looking at fact or just your gut feel, how we are doing this quarter and things like that, right, around, around that. So th there is there is ultimately great value in adapting this and going through this change. It just happens to be which company is ready for that. Uh, because, I, I think but I, I, I also say it's not, you can, you can decide that you don't want to be data driven, but ultimately you, the guy that replaces you will never make the same mistake. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's pretty clear, like in the market um, and in like just, you know, business intelligence that, you know, data is here to stay. It's always been here. How we use it now is different and we have different powers than we did 20 years ago. But, um, you know, data is fascinating. And um, Michelle, let's look at maybe the next question. Sure. I think in, to hear it, to hear the kind of the theme here, it's like change is hard, right? People, people tend to resist change no matter what level you're at. And so part of that is as the leaders to go back to Art's point, a part of that is like, is empowering people to feel comfortable with the data, to feel like they can be part of the change and all, and be part of the company and the, be part of the culture. And so let's go around. I'd love to hear a little bit about like your tips for how leaders can set up a data culture that actually empowers their teams to be involved and to be part of it and to embrace that change. Uh, Pavel, let's start with you. Yeah, so I think, yeah, this is extremely important point because you don't want uh, data to be seen as some kind of police within the company. And I think there are like really two, two tips here. Uh, one is, even though we said that the data-driven culture needs to start from the top, once you have that, you need to start from the bottom and then actually talk to the everyday users and talk to them about their problems. And then from that, identify what problems could be solved with data and then help them achieve that. So starting kind of small and with the problems down uh, of like everyday users. And the other thing is that whenever you have any reporting, uh, making sure that the reports don't just point at what is wrong, but actually help people understand how to improve it and how can, they can improve it. So if maybe they are not hitting their targets, don't just show them you are not hitting the targets, but try to help get them information that can help them improve and hit their targets. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, this goes back to what you were saying earlier about data informed um, culture. And I think what 
what you're highlighting is, you know, don't just give me the raw data in a nice chart, but give me some business guidance that will make me more effective over time. Um, anybody want to jump in, Eddie, Art? Carol, I'll Carol, can do you, that. Oh, go ahead, Rob. You just hit it. Uh, I mean, it, it, one of the ways I've seen uh, leadership uh, downstream be able to communicate the value of, uh, of being a data-driven work culture is that how the, all this will help you do your job better and easier, right? Like that ultimately is, is, the, is, the, is the huge benefit. So think of it in a remote environment. Imagine if, if your companies didn't have all this data-driven work culture going on and you had to go to the office to move paperwork around every single time, right? Like, like in order to be able to see reports and share ev everything. There. So that, that ultimately helps, hel helps the whole system when, when the workforce and the people on the front lines understand how this is helping me do my job better. And that and there is no greater value than that. You know, it, it's interesting, Art, when you talked about moving paper around, I'm thinking back to the start of my career where that was the norm. It was pre-internet. And, you know, in some ways, the data was sort of whittled down for you already. And now we have this vast amount of data where deciding which data to use and how to use it and when to use it becomes a really complex thing. Eddie, what do you think will help empower users in, in our data culture? I can think of several things. I want to mention one or two. Um, one is to tap into their agenda. Um, find those influencers. They could be in the sea level. It could be people who influence the sea levels. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, find um, their incentive to, to make a certain change, uh, something that is connected to their immediate agenda. They're really short and near-term uh, near uh, agendas. Um, and show them how you can help them very quickly um, with uh, data driven uh, or that being data informed um, and uh, create an experience that is not heavy duty for them. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't require for them to uh, engage too much. Uh, that doesn't require for them to divert from what they're already doing uh, and what they see as their goals. Um, and so you complement their goals rather than divert them from them. So these are the two things that I could think about as immediate things uh, and take stepping stones. Don't try and start boiling the ocean. Yeah, I, I like the, the concept of giving people small wins to start with that are low friction, low effort, because I think it sort of hooks them for wanting to dive deeper and to explore more. So I think that's a great tip. Um, Art, Pavel, any... Um, insights based on what uh, Eddie or folks have said already on this? I think there were some fascinating tips. Rome was not built in a day. And that's the, 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 what Eddie is saying is absolutely right. It starts with small wins and keep building it. I mean, it, depending on the which size of the company, uh, it takes three to five years to turn the ship around, uh, turning the ship around, let's just put it that way. Uh, but in a, in a much younger startup, I will tell you is, Younger companies need to adapt this faster. The longer you wait, the higher the cost it is going to be to your organization. So as me, as a founder, as a CEO of a company, my effort is how do we get, even though we don't have all the resources and the headcount and everything out there that bigger companies do, but how do we do run things more efficiently with a much smaller? So we have to use data in ways that even bigger companies don't actually use today. So that, it, because you're doing this with, 20, 30 people versus a team of 300. Any other tips from our panelists on like large company, small company, what works, what doesn't work? So, I mean, I, go ahead. No, I just wanted to reiterate, I guess, what, uh, what was mentioned about like starting very small because I think quite often you get uh, the consultants come in and scope out this huge uh, multi-million budget project about like how everything's going to be perfect with data, but then there are going to be so many problems hit uh, that the project is going to be delayed several years and it's just going to frustrate everyone. But if you start small with relatively low expectations, but if you can deliver value to someone quickly, you will start building momentum. And if you combine it then with the healthy kind of empowering culture, 
soon enough people will be coming to you with lots of ideas and then it's going to just snowball very quickly and you will get so many internal champions uh, that expanding the size of the sort of project then into other departments uh, will be super easy. I think champions is one of the best ways I've seen innovative companies basically get over this whole adoption conversation. We need to do this or not that type of stuff out by having the champions who are the voice of the rest of the team ultimately filtering, filtering that thing up. And that's how it's just that that whole culture ends up established. Let me just add, uh, I don't think really that this is um, a matter of small versus um, big. I've been working in both. Yes, with big companies, you know, to, for the full cycle to go through the whole company, it will just take longer. I think it's more about the fundamental culture. I've been working with big companies that uh, were very open to change. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been working with big companies that just had group thinking, even medium sized companies that were uh really um challenged with group thinking and 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 uh, it's really about the culture less than the size uh in any case it does require champions as uh as not said awesome michelle i know we're getting tight on time and i could listen to all of these mm -hmm. panelists for another hour or so but um in the interest of time you want to give us our final question yes yes thank you for all your insights so for, you know, I think for someone like me who is, who's, who's not a technical person, I want to use data more. I, like I said, I love a good pivot table, but sometimes data can feel very locked within a data team or a very specific data centric or technical team. And so for someone who might be very data interested or data curious, I'm curious about like, what advice do you all have for someone who isn't maybe a technical person, but wants to become more data driven or wants to have that bigger impact on their company? Um, Etty, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, if the data is locked with a data team, it's because the team doesn't want to expose it. So it's not about you being technical or not technical. It's about how you unlock the data. Um, so again, it's about uh, culture. Um, if you are um, if you are worried once you get the data, how you can make use of it, I'm a big fan of Excel. Okay, uh, you don't need to go and do SQL queries over databases as long as you can get the data out in a structured way. It's very easy to use it with Excel. Um, and if you just want to go just one step beyond that and be able to, um, to uh, kind of like enrich your data, teach yourself a little bit of macros over Excel and, and you can do really wonders. This is what I do. Awesome, great tips. Um, Art, you look like- I agree, with, yeah. I agree with, yeah, I totally agree with Eddie. Data on Excel, but I'm not a huge Excel or a Google Sheet fan in that sense that those documents float around, but it's there are better visualiz visualization tools that the leadership can bring on. So companies like Salesforce has unbelievable analytics tools that are that are there that you're able to integrate with your backend systems. And then downstream, your users can easily uh, be able to get the things they need in order to make the decision they want to. So ultimately, the user experience is what they are able to deliver that Excel and, and Google Sheets, unfortunately, do not do not offer. So th that's that's my wrap up comment. I did that for eight years and that's what I learned ultimately from that is it's in the end, it's about user experience. How if you're going to make them turn into have to have like a PhD degree in order to get into that tools, then it's not going to work. It has to be simple around the things that they norm they do day to day. So um, before I get to Pavel, you know, it, what's interesting is, you know, we're talking about culture and then as we bridge over and talk about tools, I, I think at least my experience from working with the notebooks and, and you know, different data systems over time is you want a tool that reduces the friction for the person that's using it. And Pavel, I don't know if you've got some thoughts or tips about, you know, this question. So I think in terms of uh, tooling, so I think, yeah, like in terms of tooling, uh, what we found out works quite well is kind of um, self-service approach. So uh, a system, for example, we are using Power BI a lot, which is quite good for this because in the web browser, there is very, it's very hard for anyone to mess up anything seriously. So the users don't have to be afraid of, you know, 
accidentally deleting a database or something like that. And it also makes it easily accessible to get the data that you need anytime and you don't need to kind of uh, ping an analyst every time you need the data. So I think uh, these tools that allow non-technical users to interact with this data, such as Power BI or Tableau, uh, worked really, uh, really well for us. Um, and maybe coming also to the uh, previous question, uh, I think if there is like a big silo within the data team, with the data team and the data, then I guess my advice would be to just uh, invite a member of the data team for a coffee or, or lunch, because I think I've seen, uh, and it's quite common that you have big gap between the this, uh, domain experts and the technical experts, and they often don't see the problems that the other parties see and actually building kind of bridge between those two so that they can understand what are the problems on each side is super important. And I think, you know, starting with a coffee can be a good way to get there. I know that would motivate me. So, um, you know, I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their insights. I'm really looking forward to the recap blog post because I think there were a lot of tips in this um, particular webinar that are actionable and, and people can really hit the ground running with any number of them. So I think that's super awesome. Um, I wanna thank all of our audience members for joining and for Michelle for being a co-host with me. Michelle, do you wanna kind of go through each person and? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Again, thank you for coming. I'll echo um, Carol's comments. And before we sign off, like Eddie, Pavel, Art, do you want to share the kind of the best way for folks to connect with you um, after the webinar if they want to follow up with questions or their praise or they want your autograph? Art <laughs> <laughs> uh, X. If somebody needs to reach out to me for any advice, art at circulate.com is my email, or you can uh, look us up on circulate.com. And LinkedIn. At the end, it just works. Sure. Yeah, LinkedIn for me. Okay, fantastic. Well, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure, and I've learned a bunch of stuff, and I'm sure our audience does as well. So, with that, I will close us out until we have our next notable Driving the Data Enterprise um, webinar. For that, um, Michelle will be sending out details to folks and, and posting it on, on social media. So thank you again, and everybody have a great day. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you guys doing great work. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, Paul and Eddie. Bye-bye.